I want to say Opala for having us here today. My name is Joaquin, and that refers to the Thunder Spirits, the Lakota way of our creation stories, the giver and taker of life. That was the name my parents gave me. We're from a community of the Burnt Thigh people called Little Crow's Camp. And that's where my relatives are buried. Uh, that's where we come from and derive our values and our original instructions from. And you're here on behalf of my father, Lemoyne LaPointe. And so, you know, he split us off into two. We got two for one. <laughs> <laughs> I say hello my relatives, they call me Broken Leg. My English or my American name is Thorn LaPointe. It's an honor to be here today and to come together and share gifts and our strengths as well as share wisdom, collective wisdom and intelligence. I agree with you as my relatives as that's how we come before you as a Lakota person. I don't come before you as a Democrat, Republican, economist. I don't come before you as any of that. I come before you as where I am, Lakota. And I greeted you as my relatives because my grandfather used to say that we could call ourselves a community, but if there's no relatedness, there is no community. We could call ourselves a family, but if there's no relatedness, there is no family. So the same holds true for the world community. So you see that a sense of relatedness is part of our spiritual foundation that holds us together. So I say, Wopala Tranka Maratis for having us today. So the conference has started us out with a starter question. And after that, we can just see where the scent trails to carry us. And this really is um, start, you know, starting from the place of King's letter from Birmingham jail that we started the conference with. <coughs> um, and it really has to do with that question of disruption. Um, King was responding to white clerics who said, well, too much disruption, like cool it, right? You're, you're just alienating people. Um, how do we walk that line? Is there such a thing as too much disruption? Can you go too far? Is there such a thing as not enough? Do we need to make things very uh, polarized and uncomfortable in order to change happen? Um, do we need to make things comfortable and unchallenging? Where do we locate ourselves? So I'd like to just let everybody approach that and answer it in your own way. How do you think about these things in the process of your own activity. We can go in a row or somebody who's eager and ready to jump in, we can go can anywhere you, you want. Can you repeat the question? What's the question? Um, basically it's about is it right to disrupt things and in what way and how far? How do we think of disruption as part of the work of overcoming and interrupting racism? I'd like to go first. Well, to me, we have a word called Wolakota, and it means, uh, rough translation is peace or relatedness. To me, you know, it comes down to the people could only go so far under an unjust system. You could only try to improve that system, and it could only go so far. So when they have an unjust system, it needs to be disrupted needs to be dismantled. And sometimes you don't need to improve a felon system, you need to transform it. Yeah. 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 And the people need to make the system by, for, and with the people. Because it's the people who are the primary source of expertise, knowledge. It's communities of color, indigenous communities. Everything you've ever needed to be successful strong and prosperous is in that community. It just needs to be picked up. It must be people-centered and led. Too often we have systems deactivating our original gifts. See, and the system is failing because it alienates and disqualifies our original gifts, our values, even our human value. 
So to me, there's no such thing as too much disruption as long as you have a guiding beacon. You know, disruption goes nowhere unless, you don't, unless there's a guiding post. A guiding post could be peace and relatedness. We must think of peace. If you have something to look forward to, something to march towards, you march towards justice in any issue that you're on. If it's towards peace, you have a direction to go. You know, it's matter, how we start and who leads is critical. Because if you start in the war room and here you want to get a winning strategy, you want to deploy some heavy-handed tactics to get what you want, you know, that's the way that movement's going to be. But if you start in the peace room, start on peace-building methods, of how you could come together, then that's the way it's going to go. Because Wolokot, the peace, must prevail. It's the only unstoppable force we have that could combat all the bad negativity and racism <coughs> in this world. We must not relinquish that so easily. Remember peace. Because peace is just as much a reality, it's just as real as violence. You know, we know violence. Some of you seem to believe in violence. We'll say it's all we see in the street. It's messed up. But we can't forget that peace is just as real. In my family, we say words are worlds. Because it's a study that the words that we create are directly linked to the reality we create for ourselves and our community. We've got to remember that. <laughs> I will go. Um, hello to you all. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Sasrizo Shai. Um, and the question um, is a very valuable question. Um, many t oftentimes what happens is, you know, as, as a human being, as a person of, you know, women, um, Muslim, black, immigrant, you know, bring all the titles, bring all the labels. Um, you know, with, with, with um, every issue, regardless of, of um, how different people see it, um, I think um, everyone is, is entitled to um, their own opinion. Um, but for me, when it comes to racism, um, I didn't know what racism meant before I came to America. Never hear of it. Um, and um, <coughs> now I think back, I believe every country, even if all the people are the same, like my country, everyone is the same. Everyone have, speaks the same language, religion, and everything. And look where we end up. Um, it, it, it is a system that has been created by um, a specific people that creates racism. I believe every one of us, if I understand my own racism, my own biases, then I can understand the rest. Oftentimes, each one of us say, um, I'm not a racist. But guess what? Everyone would say that. Someone is doing the racism. <laughs> <coughs> um, so I remember one day, actually, I graduated from metro school. And I remember one day my teacher asked me to go. And in order for me to, I have to go from my comfort zone. So just go to a place that you have never been and stay there and witness what's happening and all that. So it was the first day that I need to go there here. So I decided to go um, uptown Minneapolis, coffee shop. And that coffee shop, everyone there um, did not look like me. But at the same time, um, it was really interesting to witness um, because you had people that, like, it's, it's all of us, but at the same time, you sit in there and you don't understand anyone. So when I was coming at night, I couldn't sleep. I woke up in the middle of the, mo middle of the night, figuring out why I cannot sleep. 
I was so worried that I'm going to be going to that place tomorrow. Um, but usually, I don't think about it. We don't think about where are we going to go. If we want to get a coffee, you go to get your coffee. We don't think about it. But this time, I was so scared to go there and buy coffee. Um, and so in the morning, I was going there, and so many things happening in my brain. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about who's going to be there and how they're going to look. And before, I used to go there and get coffee, but I never thought about that. And here I am here, came into this uh, coffee shop, and I'm just looking. I'm like, oh, look, he's looking at me, uh, uh, you know, all of this. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about why am I, what, what is making me scared like this? And I find out that I have internal bias in going to um, that area. Um, here, we believe um, in this area, we have more um, Caucasian with, um, so I am coming here, there's all these guys, they're wearing um, uh, leathers with um, a lot of metals, um, and hair is like yellow and green and blue, <laughs> and um, with ears and <coughs> all of this, like metals everywhere, the tongue, every, I'm just, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm so shaking. I'm like, oh my God, where did I end up coming? Um, it, it's just like you have all of this because you're scared of the unknown. You don't know. Now, that is the best place. Every time I go, I, that's the best place that I like to go. I made a lot of friends. <laughs> I made a lot of friends. I met a lot of good people. And so unless we find our internal biases, we cannot overcome um, I believe that um, to overcome racism, we need to look with our own, own selves. We need to, I need to look myself. I need to figure out why do I, where did it come from? Why it's like this? Um, in the beginning when I came to America, I was watching, um, I didn't know the language, but every time I see shooting happen and I see a black guy, and I'm thinking about all oh, black guys maybe kill people here. Back then, we didn't used to do that. We're black too, but we never do that. Um, all of this is created by the media. But later on, when I learn the language and I understand how things work, I learned that black people in America are the most peaceful human being in this society. I believe that you know, unless you understand and learn, so I met friends, uh, elected officials, I met friends, I mean black Africans. <coughs> the other thing is, within, uh, as a Somali person, I see myself as being Somali, but I wouldn't be here if it was not for people like Martin Luther King, I wouldn't be here. People fought for us to be here. Um, and so we came a long way. What is holding us back right now is totally different from 20 years ago. The system was being created 1960s maybe. Who created? We all know who created, right? Um, but right now everything is different. I speak four languages. Um, my culture is totally different. I pray different way. Maybe you pray that way, I pray that way. But at the end of the day, we're all human. You're praying for a higher power, regardless of where you, you, you face. So in order for us to understand this, understanding my own biases will connect me to places and people that I never thought about. Um, so, you know, there is many things that I can talk about, but I want to tell you that in order for us to disturb that, I need to disturb within me. I need to stop that, and I need to understand what is causing, why it's causing, and how I can overcome that. And I need to open that door first, because if I don't open that door first, that gate will be closed. That huge wall will be closed. Um, and so um, I, I, I would start from my home. 
so I can go to the next door. We've got some internal disruption to deal with. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like everyone here is <laughs> go. I want to say wopala tsanka to our panelists here for offering their experiences and wisdom. When I think about disruption, I ask myself the question, what is disruption? What are we disrupting? What it is that we are truly seeking, what is it? I have to expound on those questions. For me as a Lakota person, coming from a people who seen settlers step on our shores, brought a way of life that disrupted what already existed on this land. Indigenous peoples have always had a relationship with water, with sky, with earth. We are the oldest nations, the eldest nations. We have the longest standing relationship with peace, justice, and democracy. When I think about disruption, I think about the disruption that the settler way of life brought. What the Lakota call was ichu wichoka. The ones who take the best fat for themselves. That is an illness that today we call racism. It's an illness of the human family. My mother always tells me Unchi makaki lechela oihanke wanichela. Grandmother Earth is the only one that lives forever. When I think about the original story that we all have in common here as relatives, I think about Unchi Maka, Grandmother Earth. You see, there was a story unraveling here well before humans arrived. That is the dominant narrative. But when I think about disruption, all I see are human people trying to return to their original instructions, trying to recover and restore their humanity. <coughs> that the ones who disrupted that story were settlers, capitalism, essentially a way of life that was not compatible with us as a human family. But today we look at Standing Rock, we look at all of you here, and we look at this world desperately seeking the future that was always meant to exist. When we look at water, everything water touches gives life, nourishes life helps us and enables us and enables women to bring future generations into this world. Water is telling us our original instruction to nourish, to give, to help each other. All of us can remember who we were and how we translate that into today's contemporary systems and today's various sectors at the local to the national level is dependent on our collective wisdom. You see, when settlers came, when that settler way of life came, it interceded upon processes of community, processes of visiting, of gathering our collective intelligence and wisdom and approaching the future together. For the indigenous communities, we were placed on reservations. We were allotted lands. We were unilaterally given citizenship and therefore trimmed sovereignty and self-determination. So, as we seek that future, we must remember that the community way of life, the human family way of life, is being revived and that the ones who are disrupting aren't us, but them. Those who have adopted an unsustainable way of life. So as my brother said, 
We can have community, but if there is no relatedness, there is no community. And so that's all I want to share for right now. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> so there we have restoration, which is reframed by the other side as being disruption, when it's actually a return. Um, I'd like to um, have Emilia go next and then Rashad, but first of all, um, given that we started off schedule, if one of the conference organizers can let me know how much time we have, that would be useful. We have 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Emily? Um, hi, I'll be brief. Um, why there's a need for disrupting others? As here my brother was saying, there is uh, a bigger energy that is disrupting our original ways of living. And, um, and we've, uh, as a society, have built complacency to a system that builds profit over people's suffering. Mm -hmm. Builds property over people's suffering, over hunger, over war, over dehumanizing people, over borders, um, over thirst, over fear, over self, feelings of self inadequacy. Um, <coughs> that being said, we must build tension to be able to shake things up. Um, I command everybody who is willing to invest that time, that energy, and that love, and put themselves to be the ones creating that kind of tension. I am, um, I think many of us are trying to to build that vision for the world, not from despair, as Ricardo was saying, but out of the vision. And everybody here has a role in that. Uh, <coughs> looking beyond at uh, privilege, white privilege, and what it means. And looking beyond uh, incarceration, looking beyond deportation machines, looking beyond the privatization of living. Um, as was said today, our safety, our prosperity, and our survival as human beings depends on our, on our ability to connect with one another. And sometimes, like I say, we gotta shake things up a little bit. It's, it's not easy. And I think uh, a big lie is that people believe that you are not involved. It's to believe that this doesn't have an impact on you, that you have no stake in these issues. Um, as uh, Roshan was pointing out in his video, people have to determine her, their, their own power, autonomy, and authority, and uh, self-determination through driving the movements that are about their lives. But that doesn't mean that nobody else has a role and that doesn't mean that your struggle <coughs> is connected to what's happening in liberation movements. Um, I am undocumented, and my liberation as a woman, as a queer woman of color, is deeply connected to the liberation of indigenous people as a, a mixed person who doesn't know really my ancestry because colonization never allowed my grandmother to speak her language until back when she was uh, a widow. That's when I knew that she, her first language was not Spanish, that it was Otomi. Um, and there's also that uh, moving away for resources that is stripped us away from our roots and the criminalization that happens in mainstream media that calls us criminals. And we've heard uh, in this very ugly political election all the names that people have called us and that builds an us versus them. And there's no us versus them, even when people are deeply embedded into this racial, divisive, and uh, single analysis, there is no us versus them. And I think the water protectors that are fighting right now, that are being used, um, that, are, that, that we know that are putting their lives on the line on the survival of their own people, but also for the sake of water are teaching us a big lesson. This is something that is greater. And as Ricardo was saying this morning, 
um, true solidarity comes through a big vision. That's where we really build power. Um, when we allow to bring our whole selves into movements, when we allow to speak unapologetically our truths, and that's also disruptive. Um, I think uh, it is time to speak our truths, and it's time to speak the truths of our humanity when we are living in a place where our tax dollars are being used to, to criminalize the protectors of our natural resources, uh, like the sheriff in, uh, of Hennepin County that is now in North Dakota, when our tax monies are being used to create family detention centers that have kids that have to go through court systems, <coughs> when, our, when our resources are being used to profit and create scarcity and, and drying grounds uh, all over the world. And, um, and this is why we disrupt. And uh, I guess I'm not sorry for the inconvenience. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rashad Turner. Um, if anybody in here knows me, I think you know what my answer is going to be to this question. Um, I think that disruption is very important, right? Because we live in a society that um, six or seven white people out in Oregon can occupy a space mm -hmm. and be let go and hundreds of people at Standing Rock are arrested for occupying just as the white people in Oregon was. So, I think, um, you know, when we disrupt, right, a brother to my right here said there, that there has to be a purpose, right? Why are we disrupting? And I think that when you disrupt and you hear the criticisms of, oh, we were stuck in traffic or, you know, we don't have anything to do with this. That's, that's those people, that's the police, right? That's the system. I think that we all as humans, right, each and every single one of us, at some point, uh, whether it's through implicit bias or whether it's through just us wanting to, you know, validate ourselves, uh, within that we end up invalidating other people, right? And I think that it's important um, that we all realize the intersections of oppression the intersections of oppressed people, um, but, but through that realization, not create these divisions, right? The thing that's been frustrating me the most the past couple of months is that I've seen a lot of people feeding into the division, right? And if anybody's paid attention to history, division has been probably the primary tactic that they have used against us. So when we think about doing this work or having alliances, um, having allies, accomplices, um, our friends, right? We have to do this together. Disruption is something that it, it's a must because it's 2016. We still have people being um, killed by the police unarmed, right? We still have LGBTQ people being treated differently than the next person, being called names, things like that. To me, and I don't mean this to slight um, how far we've come as a people, but I don't think that we've come that far because we're still dealing with things that we were dealing with 50 years ago, right? Women are still not paid equally to men. And, and these are things that if we're not thinking about all of these things, at some point, we as a people, the people sitting in this room, the people who care about social justice, we fail, right? I have an eight-year-old daughter, and thanks for coming today, Shia. I, we have to make sure that the future is better for her, right? When she started preschool, she came home one day and she was like, you know, why is my hair like this? Now that was a question that obviously, you know, she didn't think of, but something in that space of a preschool classroom caused her to say that, caused her to ask that question. So the myth that, you know, racism doesn't start young or implicit bias doesn't start young, to, to me that's a false narrative that leads us to think that someone else is going to do the work or leads us to think that we have to focus on this system, and until the system changes, we all can't do our part. We are the system, right? We, we are the system.
and it's something that whatever that disruption looks like, you have to disrupt it. If it's in your workplace, if it's at your home, around the dinner table with your racist uncle who comes to Christmas dinner talking all that crap, you have to check them. That's where it starts. We work in these systems, and if we don't do our part, we'll keep talking about the system, why people are dying, being put in prison, kids are uneducated. That's all I have to say. So, I mean, I think from here we'll just um, open up the panel and let people interact. I, I want to notice a couple of things real quick from what has been said. One is that um, when we talk about resources, when we say we don't want our resources <coughs> used to oppress other people, there's two issues involved. One is tactical. That's a way in which we can cut off the capacity of the other side to oppress. But the other has to do with content. And the truth is, we don't want people oppressed. It doesn't matter whose resources they use in the long run. If they were to use completely their own funding out of their own pockets, we still don't want them to suppress Standing Rock, right? The fact that they are using resources from here just gives us some leverage. Mm -hmm. But if they say, okay, we won't use those resources, that does not mean that we're satisfied. Um, there are reports being released now of people that were arrested last night at Standing Rock. And I think it's really important that we, um, I'd really like to just read a status real quick of one of the folks that was just released so we have an idea of what's happening. Uh, keep in mind the metro counties here have sent uh, forces and military backup to Standing Rock. Uh, so this is from a woman named Flores who was just released about an hour ago. Um, So one of the other things that I you know, heard from the panel is, again, that idea of disruption. If just breathing is enough to be accused of disrupting the system, of just saying, don't shoot me, of just saying, don't poison my water, is enough, that means that the very existence of, pe of oppressed people is a disruption to the system. So that means, having crossed that line already, that gives us permission to disrupt as much as is needed because there's obviously no way to not disrupt and live in relationship to the uh, colonial empire that we're part of. So the rest of the last 15 minutes or so is going to be free form. And I just thought because um, we've basically heard from everybody once. So if in other comments we can maybe interact <coughs> a little bit, riff off each other and keep our comments a, a little bit more succinct for the final piece, I think that would work nicely for all of us. I, I mean, I, I think I said what I, what I needed to say. I was going to go deeper into uh, what ra a, a racist with power can do, and that's why I tapped up a little bit on what Hennepin County Sheriff uh, Authority is using resources for. Uh, but this is not the first time. Um, Hennepin County has been one of the, the places that the system has used to remove uh, non and I don't even want to say non-dangerous, but undocumented. He, he has been a vehicle to separate mixed-status families in the state of Minnesota. 
um, he has taken the authority to voluntarily not only charge people with, uh, with charges that in, a, in, a, in an immigration law are pipelined back to deportation, but he also has used his, his power to, to criminalize and follow up on, on people that hide under more, more in t deep into the shadows. Uh, I am aware that what I'm saying can be uh, dangerous for myself as an undocumented woman that lives in Hennepin County and that he's very aware where I am, who I organize with, and where my family is. Uh, but I think that enough is enough. Uh, we've known this for years <coughs> and he's an elected official. And I think that it's, it's in all of us to be able to, to build enough power to remove that man from office. Um, I think, um, I think, I mean, I'm, um, that's, that's one thing where I think our livelihoods of, of black people, brown people, immigrant people, Muslims, and uh, now indigenous people can center some synergy in, in this one piece, but we know that the vision is greater. Uh, but I, I, I kind of just wanted to tap a little bit on that. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I was just going to add, um, as a people, we, we have money, right? We have purchasing power. <laughs> I think right now at Standing Rock, that's an example of when you hit their pockets, that's what hurts them the most. That's what they care about. <coughs> so I think when we think about disruption or um, disrupting the status quo, whatever it be, we have to think about how can we have an economic impact. All right, they'll put all of these commercials on TV to get our money, but then they'll lock us up. They'll kill us, right? They'll have undocumented people who are here doing good work, starting families, being productive members of society, probably even more productive than some people here, living in fear. We shouldn't have to live in fear as a people, and I think a tactic that we must use is where we're spending our money, so boycotting places that are not about social justice, that are not about equality, equity, um, and also, she's not in here anymore, but she says shut it down, right? When we shut something down, how can we have an economic impact that makes these people have to recognize us, right? Have to do something different. They're not arresting those people in Standing Rock because they're being violent. Right? They're arresting them because they're messing up their paper. They're messing up their money. Mm -hmm. And to me, when you put <coughs> profits over people, we as a people have to recognize that and not make excuses. One of the things that, you know, when I was with Black Lives Matter St. Paul, we'd always get the criticism that you hear of, you know, the tactics. Why do, why do you do this? Why do you do that? To me, we have to give these people a taste of their own medicine. Right? If, if they're going to try to bully us, we got to bully them. It's not that I walk around every day being a bully, but if I have to tell Mayor Coleman, hey, this change is taking too long. Hey, as we're protesting this person's death, well, the cops got another one. We have to do something, and if money's the thing that they recognize the most, let's affect them dollars, just like they're doing in Standing Rock. Speak a bit more. I think the other part that we can um, disturb this is for us to be at the table. It's for us to make the d decisions. So the Hennepin County is not the people. Who's doing it is elected official. He's using his power. If you're who voted for him, we voted for him. What we need to do is, we need to be at the table and be part of decision makers. If we're not at the table, if you're not sitting there, all the policies that have been created will affect you. So in order for us to disturb this, we need to be part of the decision makers. You need to be sitting at the table, and you need to be voting, and you need to be saying no to things that will, ben will not benefit your, f your community and your family. So run for offices <coughs> from the bottom up. Join community um, um, councils 
and, 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 and I think that would be one of the best things. With every election, with every group, there is people that, that, that look, don't look like you. So in order for us to make the decisions, in order we need to be at the table, and we need to empower and support people that look like us. We need to financially, physically, and psychologically help people that look like us to be part of the decision makers, however we can do. Now I know Antonia was sitting right there. She is an example. She has done a lot of great things, and I'm serving on the uh, Cultural and Ethnic Communities Leadership Council. Well, guess what? A few years ago, that council did not exist. We created that, uh, that council, and now that council is in the executive branch of the governor's office. And whatever we come up with, ideas and policies that we create will affect people. But you know what? It's affecting us in a good way. And so you have to be on the table. So, um, Thorne, you had something to say, and then there's also a hand up there after, after you. Oh, okay. Well, before I talk, I want to talk a little about indigenous peoples and our relationship to Unchi Makad, Mother Earth. See, we have to understand who indigenous peoples are. Indigenous peoples, what indigenous means, it's not just a political identity. Indigenous is a world movement. Indigenous is a world story. A people is comprising numbers up to 374 million worldwide. That's 374 million gifts, stories, strengths, and possibilities. But you see, indigenous is just a human being way of life. It's a way of life that reminds us what it means to be related to the earth a way of life that reminds us to remember our mother. Because we believe what happens to the earth happens to us. You see, indigenous peoples worldwide, I was at the United Nations and I heard a report that 80% of the world's rich biodiversity is on indigenous people's land. We are the last stronghold. If this biodiversity goes, you will have rare, as well as cultural diversity spilling into nothingness, then we really will be poor as human beings. Our humanity will be gone. Because we remember what it is to be native to the land. Indigenous is just simply the human being way of life. But <laughs> what my relative said here is true. What my relative said when she got up and spoke is true. We have to disrupt. But at the same time, I had thoughts that I had written down before about this. I write to myself sometimes. <laughs> and I said, uh, we, have come point, we have come to a point in this country to where we see the actions of our citizens as water protectors, our criminalists, while the actions of corporate interests, destructive corporate interests, are justified. You see, to me, no amount of rationalization could justify the pollution of fresh drinking water. Drinking water is an inherent human right. It is also the foundation of life. We have to understand that water is a global issue. Each water issue, each water crisis that you will see erupt just like Standing Rock should not be seen in isolation. It should see, be connected to a world issue. You see, there is teachings and understands I was picking up from other thought leaders and scholars like Webb, Du Bois, who said, mankind must put an end to ignorance, or ignorance will put an end to mankind. JFK once said, mankind must put an end to war, or else war will put an end to mankind. You see, what happens to the earth happens to us, so it is that same Less than that same line of thought that says that mankind must put an end to water pollution or else water pollution will put an end to mankind. You see, I do human rights advocacy. I'm with a delegation called American Indian Movement West. 
And when I was at the United Nations, I heard an expert say that unclean water kills more people than war a year. So we have to understand that water is not an issue that's just going to go away. We cannot just turn our backs and hope it's just going to disappear. Water is an issue that's going to choose all of us, whether we like it or not. Just as race chose black America, Latinos, Native America in the 60s, it's going to choose us. And if we do not take corrective action now, if we do not disrupt then water will be the next biggest fight, the next biggest war you will ever see in this world. So we have to understand, we have to disrupt, but we also have to march towards water justice and peace and prayer, just as the Hunkapapa, who are leading this march towards justice, I've said, with prayer. But we ask you to do all you can, all of you are connected, all of you have networks, you know, we're not asking for a complete answer. All we're asking is that you try. And try your best in the best way you know how to help our people, the Lakota people, the Hunkpapa Lakota, the water protectors. So I want to say about that much. So, and isn't it, isn't it despicable that we even need to say those things? Mm -hmm. Right? These are things that are so basic. Okay, you had a question or comment? Thank you. Do you agree, Jan, that we should I mean, there should not be a quay oh. from Boys Work Bank? Oh. And I am the legislative director for Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Sure. And I wanted to make an announcement, speaking of um, disruption. Today at 2.30, there's a demonstration at the <coughs> County Sheriff's Office. Mm. And after that demonstration, we will occupy the mansion to demand Governor Dayton to pull back the officers. Mm -hmm. I won't be in attendance because I'll be going and picking up uh, those who are arrested and bringing them back to Stanley Rock today. So if you can make yep. it, I know that, that this conference is important, but this demonstration also is important to me. Oh. They've given me a very rigid cutoff, so I don't keep it. Yeah. I just want to say that when we were at the United Nations, Orrin Lyons spoke to indigenous representatives from all over the world. He asked them, how do we instruct seven billion people as to their relationship with Mother Earth? How do we remember the original story within our nations? How do we make that return? And so he said the first law of life is water. Just as the Ocheti Shakuin say, Mini Wichoni, water is life. Oh. This is an original instruction. More unclean water kills more people than war. The very existence of fresh water is being threatened at this very moment. And as we see the armed settlers from various states stepping in the paths of their ancestors, who once violated the 1851 treaty in 1874 during the gold rush. Mm -hmm. They are reenacting what their ancestors did. They are setting up forts at Fort Rice just like their ancestors did during the treaty era. They are attacking us because we are indigenous, because we remember these original instructions. Von Deloria once said, we have always had wars, but we have never had a war for peace. So now, the fight is just as the same as it was then. But this time, they are looking from gold to the sacred waters of indigenous peoples. So if peace is the only weapon that is capable of winning against the bad in this world, then we must do everything we can to hold on to it. Just as our Hunk Papa, just as the Ocheti Shakui, and representatives of indigenous peoples at the United Nations in Stani Rock are doing. So, 
This is what happens when we have multiple voices in the room and we take the time to listen to each other. You see how enriching that is in terms of perspective? And it just it made me think of two things. One is the most powerful organizing concept ever devised. An injury to one is an injury to all. Mm -hmm. And that's on the <laughs> political realm, but to bring it down home to the personal realm, as Pastor Danny Givens of St. Paul likes to quote, I can't remember who he's quoting, but he likes <laughs> us to know it's not his. There's no such thing as other people's children. Uh, yes. With that, I would like to thank our panelists and our audience.